Hi, right, Ninja Nerds. In this video, we're going to talk specifically about the distal convoluted tubule. So if you guys haven't already seen it, go and watch the loop of Henley, all right, and even the proximal convoluted tubule before that, because now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and start here. So if you guys remember, if you guys have already caught up to this point, you'll remember that we talked about what's happening here. Remember that we actually have the proximal convoluted tubule, and then we had the here, the loop of Henley. And again, the loop of Henley was consisting of this descending portion here and this ascending portion here. And now we're going into the distal convoluted tubule. And if you guys remember, we said that there was a specifically tubular reabsorption here. So whenever we're moving substances from the actual uh, kidney tubules to the actual blood, and we talked about many of the mechanisms there. And then we also talked about how these mechanisms could also be going in the reverse direction. So how we can move specific types of solute molecules from the blood into the kidney tubules through tubular secretion. So this is tubular secretion. And this event right here was tubular reabsorption. And we had many, many things that were going on here. All right. And if you guys also remember what was happening here in the loop of Henle. Well, if you guys remember, you can recall there was <coughs> on the ascending limb, there was these specialized transporters, right? And these specialized transporters were pumping in sodium, potassium, and two chloride ions into the actual cells here of the actual ascending loop of Henle. And then here on the basal lateral membrane, you had these channels to pump the sodium out here. You had the channels to pump the actual two chloride ions out here. And you even had some channels that were actually pumping some of the potassium ions there, but not as many. And the same thing was going on here on this channel, so same thing. Sodium, potassium, two chloride ions were being pumped out here. And then again, there's a channel here, channel here, and a channel here. And the sodium ions were being pumped out. Sodium and then the potassium ions were being pumped out. And the two chloride ions were being pumped out. And if you guys remember, what was this doing? It was concentrating the sodium and the chloride out here, the potassium ions out here. And what was the whole purpose of that? Wasn't it making the medullary interstitium very, very salty? Because if you remember, what was the actual gradient as we moved down? We said it was approximately 300 milliosmoles here. As we moved down, let's say it went down to about 500 milliosmoles. As we kept going down, we said it could get down to about 700 milliosmoles. It got dropped down to 900 milliosmoles, and then it can get up to 1,200 at the deepest parts of the renal medulla. And again, this was milliosmoles per liter, milliosmoles, milliosmoles, and milliosmoles and milliosmoles. And again, what was contributing to this actual, as you're moving downwards, the medullary interstitial gradient is, is actually increasing. It's getting saltier. It's because of these sodium, potassium, two chloride co-transporters. Also, if you remember, some of this actual potassium ion was leaking out here. Remember, some of the potassium ions were actually being pushed out here. And whenever the potassium ions were actually accumulating out here, it was generating a little bit of an actual charge across these actual inner cell membrane of the ascending tubules. And what did that do? That charge actually caused some of the calcium ions and the magnesium ions to bounce up against these charges and be repelled and then move out here, right? So then the magnesium was accumulating out here as well as the calcium was accumulating out here. And these were also contributing to the medullary interstitial gradient, right? And as I was making this really, really salty, what was happening? It was pulling what molecules out? Remember, it was pulling molecules of water out. So water was being pulled out here. All right, cool. Now, why did I mention all this? Because if you guys remember, 65% of the sodium was absorbed here. 65% of the water was absorbed here. Then if you go to the remaining parts here, here in the actual descending limb of Upa Henley, about how much water was actually absorbed. Okay, we got 65. Then if I add on another about 15%, about 15%, what does that leave me with? Okay, so 15 plus 65, 70, 80%, right? So what does that mean? How much water do I have going into this distal convoluted tubule then? So going up here to the distal convoluted tubule, I might only have about 20% water going over here. That's why I'm mentioning all this stuff. 65% sodium was reabsorbed here. How much sodium was actually reabsorbed here? Approximately 35%. So 35% of that sodium that was actually coming out here, 35% of it was actually being in this reabsorbed process. Okay, so how much does that leave? Okay, 65 plus 35. 
Okay, it's gonna be 70. Okay. Uh, whoopsie, I made a mistake. This should not be 35. This should be 25. That is my, I'm sorry. So 25%. So 65% plus this 25%, that leaves you with a remaining 10%. Okay, so this so would leave you with a remaining 10% of this sodium ions. <clears throat> okay. So you have about 10% of the sodium ions remaining, 20% of the water ions remaining. And again, this was called that countercurrent multiplier mechanism, right? And then this was also the vasorector, which was helping to be able to maintain that by preventing the rapid removal of salt. All right, so that's good enough. I just wanted to get you guys up to this point of why I had 10% sodium left and why I had 20% water left. Also, what is the actual um, osmolality here? Because if you remember, it was approximately here inside of the PCT, it was actually 300 milliosmoles, and then as it left here from the actual what? As you go down the descending loop of Henle, it actually become very, very salty, and it was 1,200 milliosmoles, right? Because it was losing a lot of the water. Then as it ascended, it went up here, and we said it was about to anywhere around 100 to 200 milliosmoles, but generally it's right around 100, okay? So 100, 125. Okay, now that is what we have. Now what we need to figure out is how is some of these molecules being reabsorbed here in the distal convoluted tubule and how are molecules being secreted? That's what we're going to do now. Okay, so in the early part, so this whole part here is the distal convoluted tubule right here. Okay, this whole top part here. But we can divide it into two parts. We can say coming about right here. Let's come to about right here. If I come about right here, anything in front of this actual uh, purple line here is the early distal tubule. So again, this is the early distal tubule. I'm going to put DT there. And over here on this side is going to be the late distal tubule. So over from here is going to be the late distal tubule. All right. In the early distal convoluted tubule, there's some specialized transporters here. Look at this. This is pretty cool. Let's do this in this color here. So there's some specialized transporters here on the actual luminal membrane closest to the actual urine, right? On this, there's going to be this specialized channel. And before we talk about the channel, there's another channel in the basolateral membrane, so back here. You know they're on almost every single cell within our body, right? These channels are sodium potassium ATPase. And they're pumping what? They're pumping sodium ions out and they're pumping potassium ions in. And if we really should be picky, we should say that it's actually pumping three sodium ions out and two potassium ions in. Same thing here, pumping three sodium ions out into the actual extracellular fluid and pumping two potassium ions into the cell in the intracellular fluid. But what do we say? Because they're pumping them against their concentration gradients, what does these two steps here require? They require the presence of ATP. So this will require ATP, and this step will also require ATP. Because you're pumping them against their concentration gradients. But here's what's really cool. You know, you know what other ions actually were going to be present here too? So we said there's about 10% of the sodium uh, left. You know what else is a little bit left here too? Besides that, chloride ions. So there's even going to be some chloride ions. There's even going to be other ions here too. There's going to be calcium that we're going to talk about here in a second. So there can even be other different ions. But for, for right now, we're going to talk about chloride, sodium, and we'll talk here about calcium in a second. Okay, now sodium concentration right here in the actual, specifically what, this actual? luminal fluid, the actual uh, filtrate, which is in the, getting ready to make urine. This concentration out here is actually going to be higher because we're pumping sodium ions out here. So the sodium concentration inside the cell here is actually going to be very low. So that means that sodium ions are going from high concentration to low concentration via this transporter. Well, guess what else can happen? We can take chloride ions with us. So because of that, we can take these chloride ions with us. And this is going to be through this symporter. So this is a sodium chloride, so that's a sodium chloride symporter. Because it's moving in the same direction. And if we take the sodium and this chloride into the cell, what can happen then? You have these actual pumps here. And what can happen? You can actually have that sodium be pushed out. What can happen to the chloride? Chloride has spe uh, special channels. Let's draw these channels here. Let's do it in this purple color here. And these chloride ions have a special channel. And what can happen is we can take this actual chloride and pump it out into the blood. And that is what can happen. So look at that. We can get the chloride ion into the blood. And we can get some of these sodium ions into the blood, right? So it's a pretty cool mechanism right there. OK, so again, what can happen in the early distal tubule? Some of this sodium, there's 10% remaining. 
out of this 10%, only 5 to 6% of it is going through this process in the early distal tubule. So again, out of this 10%, only 5 to 6% of it is being reabsorbed here in the early distal tubule. Okay, so that means that there's only about, about 3 to 4% remaining. Okay? All right. I'm sorry, uh, uh, 4 to 5% uh, remaining. Okay? So now, 10%. Out of that 10%, 5 to 6% of it was actually being reabsorbed here within the early distal tubule via the sodium chloride symporters, which are going to be helping to get them in. And then the sodium potassium pumps are basically helping to decrease the sodium concentration in the cell so that it can move down its concentration gradient. All right, boom, done. So we talked about the sodium and we talked about the chloride ions. Now let's talk about this calcium. You know, there's a hormone that our parathyroid gland produces whenever our actual uh, calcium levels within the blood are low. So let's say here, up here at the top, I actually have low blood calcium levels, right? So let's say here in the blood, I actually have low blood calcium levels, right? Well, what this low blood calcium levels can actually do is you have here, let's say here's your thyroid gland. In the back of the thyroid gland, you have these little uh, glands here in the back, and they're called your, what is this structure called? Parathyroid glands. When you have low blood calcium levels, these low blood calcium levels can stimulate these parathyroid glands to produce a hormone called parathyroid hormone. So depending upon the, the demands of the body, this calcium will either get reabsorbed or will just get go out in the urine. It all depends upon the demands of the body. So what happens is this parathyroid hormone, it has a receptor present here on this actual cell of the distal convoluted tubule. Look at this and here it actually can bind on. So look, this parathyroid hormone can be circulating in the blood and it can come and actually bind onto this receptor and stimulate this receptor. If it stimulates this receptor, it'll activate a second messenger system. So what can it do? It can activate a G-stimulatory protein. That G-stimulatory can bind GTP. That can come over here and bind onto a effector enzyme. What is that effector enzyme called? This enzyme is called adenylate cyclase. What does he do? He takes ATP and converts it into cyclic AMP. What does cyclic AMP do? Activates protein kinase A. And then if you guys have done, seen this mechanism so many times, you already know what's gonna happen. What does protein kinase A do? Well, here on the actual cell membrane, the luminal membrane, there's these actual calcium modulated channels. So there's these calcium modulated channels here. And these channels are going to be very, very sensitive to the actual changing levels of parathyroid hormone. So if the parathyroid hormone is present, it's going to activate this protein kinase A. And guess what this protein kinase A is going to do? It's going to come over here and it's going to stimulate these channels. If it stimulates these channels by phosphorylating them, right, so it can put some phosphates on this channel, some phosphates here, it's going to activate these channels. And guess what they're going to do? Any calcium that's actually present here in the urine, uh, in the filtrate that's getting ready to make urine, will be sucked in. Okay, so this calcium will be sucked in here. Now some of this calcium can be bound, a small percentage of it can be bound to a protein inside of it called calbindin, but most of it we want to get onto the blood because we want to increase the blood calcium levels. Well, how do we do that? Okay, calcium is going to be in specifically, calcium is in a, a lower concentration inside the cell right now. It's in a higher concentration out in the blood. And remember, this is, I know that the calcium levels are low. Don't get confused here. Yes, the blood calcium levels are low, but still, the amount of calcium present within the cell is much lower than that, okay? So this gradient is it have to go against its concentration gradient. Well, we have a way of dealing with that. Our body is so clever. We have these proteins here on the actual basal lateral membrane. And look what they can do. They can help to pump some of this calcium out here into this actual blood. And then what it can do with it is it can bring sodium ions in. Because sodium, again, will be moving from, it's usually always in higher concentration outside the cell. So if it's in a higher concentration outside the cell, it's gonna move from high concentration to low concentrations in the cell. This is an example of a secondary active transport. So again, this is a secondary active transport. There is another mechanism too, and all it's doing is, let's say here I put another pump I put another pump and I put this one in green. So I have to make this one a green pump. This green pump here, all it's doing is it's taking the calcium and it's pumping it out here against its concentration gradient. And it's bringing protons in. 
So this would directly utilize ATP. This process would directly utilize ATP. So this is an ATP dependent process. Okay, so that's how this mechanism is working. All right, so let's quickly review the early distal tubule. What's happening? As the urine is coming up, it's coming up with an actual hypo, what would you call this? Hypotonic, right? Because the actual uh, osmolality is very, very low because there's going to be a decent amount of water, in this case, very little solutes, right? About 100 to 100, uh, 120 milliosmoles, but again, it could range up to 200, just depends upon the situation. There's about 10% of the sodium remaining, about 20% of the water remaining. There's a little bit of chloride, there's a little bit of calcium, there's other ions here too. But we said in the early distal tubule, there's these specialized sodium chloride symporters that are bringing the sodium and the chloride into the actual cell by secondary active transport. How? Because these sodium potassium pumps are pumping the sodium out, concentrating it outside the cell and causing the concentration inside the cell to be lower. So sodium moves down its concentration gradient, which helps to pull chloride with him. Then the other part is that calcium is also here present within our actual filtrate. If we want to get the calcium into the blood, what would need to be the stimulus? We would need to have hypocalcemia, low blood calcium levels, which would stimulate the parathyroid gland to make parathyroid hormone, which would stimulate these actual cells within the distal convoluted tubule to activate protein kinase A, which will phosphorylate these modulated calcium channels on the luminal membrane and pull calcium in. Some of the calcium can bind to calbindin, but most of the calcium will actually go out into the blood to increase the blood calcium levels and bring it back to normal values. Okay. Now, why did I mention that sodium chloride symporter? Because you know there's drugs that can actually inhibit this. That's the whole point is knowing why you know sometimes we're mentioning all these darn things. You know, this is what's called thiazide. Thiazide is basically a diuretic. It basically inhibits this actual sodium chloride symporter. And if it inhibits the sodium chloride symporter, five to six percent of the actual sodium that you're going to reabsorb, and also water can follow, you know, depending upon whether the actual ADH hormone is present, that would affect the actual salt reabsorption and the water reabsorption. So instead of actually allowing for it to reabsorb, you'd lose the salt and the water in the urine, right? Called di diuresis. So you'd lose the blood volume a little bit. All right. That's that part. Now let's come to the late distal tubule. The later part of the distal tubule has these specialized cells that are responsible for responding to aldosterone. Okay, so let's see here. What hormone, where was that hormone actually going to be produced, the aldosterone? If you guys remember, if you come over here to this right corner, we had the adrenal gland. So here's our adrenal gland right here. Sits on top of the kidneys, right? And there was this one part of the adrenal gland, which was up at the top part, consist of these actual globular-like cells, right? And these globular cells were responding to different types of uh, stimuli. And they were producing a hormone called aldosterone. And then aldosterone would do what? It would actually circulate to this actual cell. What were some of the stimuli for aldosterone production, if you guys remember? One of the stimuli was actually going to be a very powerful stimulus due to angiotensin II. And the other stimulus was actually going to be what? Whenever the actual sodium levels within the blood are decreasing, and whenever the potassium levels within the blood are increasing. Okay? So whenever you have hyponatremia and hyperkalemia, that can stimulate the actual adrenal gland to produce aldosterone. Okay. So now, now that we know that, and there is other stimuli, they even believe that CRH, a little bit of the corticotropin releasing hormone, small amounts of the corticotropin releasing hormone can also stimulate this too, okay? Anyway, what is aldosterone doing? Okay, well, we gotta remember something. Aldosterone was actually a steroid hormone, right? So look here, let's see, here's our aldosterone. We'll do it with this A. Aldosterone is a steroid hormone, so it can actually pass right through the actual lipid bilayer of the cell. As it passes through the lipid bilayer of the cell, do you guys remember that it stimulates specific genes, activates transcription factors? When it activates those transcription factors, it leads to the production of different types of proteins. Let's look at those proteins. So let's say here's one protein that's actually being produced. And let's say that there's going to be another protein that's going to be produced. We'll make this in green back here. And then there's going to be another protein. We'll make this one. Let's just make this one black. And here's this other protein. So three proteins are being made. So now let's draw each one of these proteins. So here's one protein which is going to be in here in the actual basolateral membrane. You guys probably already know what this protein is. 
Then there's going to be another protein which is embedded into the luminal membrane. So here's this protein here in the actual luminal membrane. And then there's going to be another protein which is embedded here in the actual luminal membrane as well. Okay. These, the, this late part of the distal tubule, you need to understand, is very, very um, specific. So when we look at the distal tubule in general, it's impermeable to water. It's generally impermeable to water. It depends upon hormones to make it permeable. And also, you noticed here that the, in the early distal tubule, the solutes could actually be reabsorbed independent of hormones. But in this part here, calcium is dependent upon hormones. This right here, the late distal tubule, is also dependent upon hormones. Okay? Now, aldosterone can stimulate this actual cell. And what it does, at least this proteins here, the development of this protein, and this protein can actually lead to the actual allowing of sodium ions to come into the cell. So now we can have sodium ions coming into the cell. And why can sodium ions come into the cell? I got you. Look, sodium ions here, it makes this other protein. Guess what this protein's doing? It's pumping out three sodium. It's pumping in what? Two potassium ions. So this is pumping out three sodium ions and pumping into the cell two potassium ions. Two potassium ions. And then over here, two potassium ions. Why is this important? Okay. So what's happening to the sodium concentration in the cell? Well, sodium is leaving. So the sodium concentration inside the cell is going to decrease. Okay, what's happening to potassium? Well, we're concentrating the potassium into the cell, right, more than we normally are. Because normally potassium is always high in the cell. So the potassium concentration inside the cell is actually going to increase. So now, sodium is going to want to go from low concentrations to high concentrations. And then it's going to get reabsorbed. So then where can it go from here? As it gets it's going to go and get reabsorbed out into the blood and bring more sodium ions into the blood. So the sodium ions within the blood are going to go up. But then the problem was that we had a lot of potassium in the blood. The problem was also that we had a lot of potassium in the blood. We had this hyperkalemia, right? Well, now we're going to pull potassium out of the blood, put it into this cell through the sodium potassium pumps, and guess what else is going to happen? That potassium right there, look where it's going. It's going right out here. Let's chuck that sucker out in the urine. So now potassium ions are getting excreted out into the urine. But again, it's moving from high concentration to low concentration. And the same thing here. The sodium ions are going from high concentration to low concentration. So it's not requiring any energy. The only one that requires energy is this structure back here, which is the sodium potassium pumps. And they can require the utilization of ATP to make ADP an inorganic phosphate, right? Okay, so now, if the sodium ions are being reabsorbed into the blood, what's happening to the sodium ions within the blood? They're going up. If the potassium ions are getting yanked out of the blood and then secreted, what's happening to the potassium levels in the blood? It is going down. Okay, so now the, potass so the, the potassium ions within the blood are going down. And what was the problem originally? Well, the problem, one of the problems originally was that there was low sodium levels within the blood and that there was high potassium levels. Well, we fixed that. We brought the sodium levels up and we brought the potassium levels down. Angiotensin II is a stimulus because it wants to increase blood pressure. And I'll explain why here in just a second why that can happen. Okay. Now, what is really important here is there's another hormone that can be present here within this area. And it's called the antidiuretic hormone. So if the antidiuretic hormone is present, we're going to go into his mechanism in another video, but I just want you to understand something here. The antidiuretic hormone, also called vasopressin, can act on these cells as well. And what it'll do is it'll help to make these little pores inside of the membrane. Because remember I told you that generally the distal convoluted tubule and even the collecting duct is impermeable to water. It depends upon hormones. If ADH is present, ADH can actually act on these cells and open up these aquaporins and pull water in. And the water will love to follow the salt. And if the water is following the salt, what will happen to the amount of water getting pulled into the bloodstream? The water volume will go up. And if the water volume goes up, what happens to your actual blood pressure? The blood pressure goes up, which helps to be able to take care of that issue with angiotensin too, right? And we'll, again, we'll go over this mechanism with the ADH because it's more important that we understand how it's working within the collecting duct. But it can be acting in the distal convoluted tubule, the late part of the distal tubule. But again, if ADH is not present, you're not going to be able to pull out of water with it. But again, remember that the water will love to follow the actual sodium ions. And it will go into the blood, increase the actual blood volume, which will increase the blood pressure.
Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go over these intercalated A cells and intercalated B cells. But we actually should couple this with the actual uh, collecting duct cells. So what we're going to do is we're going to stop this video here and we're going to go into the next part where we're actually going to talk about specifically the collecting duct uh, cells, specifically with ADH, and we'll talk about the intercalated A cells and the intercalated B cells. All right, engineers, I'll see you guys in that video. All right.